We have two readings tonight. Uh, the first one is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, first verse to verse 17. Matthew 4, 1 to 17. I will just make one comment before I start. It re refers to both of the passages. I think it's important, although we see truths in just a few verses to see things in the context in which they were done in which they were said and it becomes then more obvious how it all works out together so verse 1 Matthew 4 then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now when Jesus heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> we thank the Lord for his word. Our second reading is from the Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation, the circumcision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel 
of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We thank the Lord for his word. A subject tonight, it's concerned with salvation. And because I couldn't get it all into one, I've uh, split it up. I've got the second one finished as well. <laughs> and um, for another day, as they say. But uh, even that may end up with a third one, so um, we'll see. But I've headed it up, salvation, the cost and the call. The cost relating to not just us, but for Jesus, because he died on the cross. And the cost to us, because if we're receiving that gift from God, there is a price to pay. And scripture makes it quite clear that there has to be a change. Not a little improvement, but a complete turnaround, what we call repentance. But I'll come to that in greater detail. But I also want to look at the call, what we are called to do when we are true believers. Now, I am fully aware that, as far as I know, everybody here is saved, which is wonderful. But there are so many buildings called churches up and down this land and in other countries which may be packed, absolutely packed, but the people are not saved. They have not received the whole truth of God's word. And it's quite clear in scripture, the Apostle Paul, we read about it in Acts, where he says, I have not neglected to bring to you the whole counsel of God the whole mind of God. In other words, the whole word of God. So often you will find 
speakers, ministers, and they will have their favourite topic, and it will be just that. And it's like looking at a painting, but instead of seeing the whole painting, you're just looking at one little tiny bit. And we need to see the whole picture, the whole picture, and our salvation. We have to remember, although it involves us, we are the recipients of that salvation and there's nothing we can do to earn it or to pay for it. Now I know we are all aware of this, but I think it does us good sometimes, even when we know that we actually stop and think about it. And the ramifications, if you like, of some of these things. Now, there's a very curious thing that happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And our salvation is a very precious thing. And I would like to remind us all of the beginning of that ministry. We read about it tonight. We see it in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 3 and 4. And it's important to see it in context, which is why we read what went beforehand. In Matthew 3, we have the account concerning John the Baptist. Now, to be quite honest with you, I often put him in the same category as Elijah. Neither of them were, if you like, well-dressed chaps who turned up with the word. They were what I would describe as the rough diamonds. And they had no qualms about challenging what we might term higher authority and telling them quite bluntly what was going on. In Elijah's case, he had which to all the people must have seemed, the temerity to turn up to the king and say, it's not going to rain here until I say so. He just thought, well, that's a cheek. But we find something similar with John the Baptist. All the religious leaders were uh, hovering around and what does he call them? You can't say he was, uh, you know, being very polite. Some of the terms he used. But he wasn't going to back down. And he, again, crossed the ruler. Herod. Because Herod was living with his brother's wife. And John had told him the truth. You shouldn't have her. She's another man's wife. Well, Herod wasn't very pleased. And his lady friend even less so. And he literally lost his head. But he wasn't going to back down either. But there is something else. In the account of John the Baptist, and we must remember that he is the forerunner or the messenger referred to in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And in Matthew 3 verses 11 and 12, John prophesies about the one who was to come. Well, what had John's message been? We know. And it was very simple. And Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us exactly what was said. It 
In verse 1 it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. His message had been that you need to repent. That was the, the, the crux of his message. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3 told us there that what he then said was what was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. He prophesied about a voice in the wilderness and making a way or preparing the way of the Lord and making his path straight. He wasn't just identifying a coming prophet, but he was actually identifying the Lord himself. Not just a man, but God incarnate. John's message was simple. It did not refer to the temple or the temple sacrifices it was a simple call to repent. The baptism of John basically showed that people were to be serious about their public declaration of their repentance. After baptizing Jesus, Jesus went into the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan. Forty days and nights. And then Jesus went to Capernaum from Nazareth, again fulfilling prophecy. In Isaiah 9 and verse 1. In Matthew chapter 4, that what you read, the last verse says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the beginning of his ministry. And it was the same words as in Matthew 3 verse 2 concerning what John said. John was the forerunner of Jesus. The message was the same. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now Jesus' mission was very clear. It's quite some years back now since it became very much a fashion in business in this country and the Western world generally for businesses to have a mission statement so that you knew what the company was aiming at and some of them quite honestly are just ridiculous but there was nothing mistaken about Jesus mission and the clearest exposition of it is in Luke 19 and verse 10 and it says that he came to seek and save that which was lost. It's a matter of the greatest importance that a man or woman knows how to obtain this salvation. Now, Jesus' atonement and his sacrifice, again in fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy, occurred at the end 
of his ministry. And in this passage today, we're looking at the beginning. But the fact is that mankind's efforts, mankind's works, would not accomplish anything. You see, mankind is the recipient of God's grace, the object of God's mercy. He could not pay for it, but God had the answer. And the answer was that he sent his son, his only begotten son, to be that full and complete sacrifice once for all, sufficient for the sins of the whole world. A, satisfa a satisfaction for sin, which was able to deliver all who would come to him and acknowledge their sin and desire to turn from it and go God's way. That is what repentance is all about. Jesus came to seek and to save us, but it needed us as individuals to respond to him. The challenge is, will we repent? Do we have that desire to go God's way? One thing that has been on my mind many, many years. And it comes from having been to, over the years to many, many funerals. And the number I've come to where the person concerned was probably a nice person or could have been a complete rogue. But the words given by the minister in the funeral service and talks about our dear brother recently departed. And the person you knew hadn't a thought for God in their life. What about them? The truth is that salvation, our salvation, is on God's terms, not ours. The decision as to where we spend eternity isn't made when we arrive outside heaven and as some people would think there's St Peter looking out over and asking for our name so he can go and look us up. The decision isn't made then. There's no argument. The decision is made in the here and now when we're alive and kicking as it were. And the eternal life doesn't begin the moment we die. The eternal life begins the moment we're born again. The thing is, we also need a personal salvation. There is nothing in the scripture to remotely suggest that we can come as a crowd, almost like a job lot. Those who are saved are those who have individually accepted Jesus Christ as their saviour. It doesn't mean it can't happen in a big crowd, but what I'm getting at, I'm sure you appreciate, is that it's the individual's response in every occasion. It's not about just raising our hand in a meeting. It is a serious decision, a personal salvation worked out by Jesus, the personal saviour. It's essential that people understand the enormity and serious nature of repentance. Because without repentance, 
there can be no forgiveness. When we stand before God, it's too late for people to say, oh, I, I didn't really mean that, or I meant something else, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, um, you're a, a forgiving God. It's too late. The decision is made in this life. It's certainly nothing to do with our name being on a church register or anything of that nature. It's nothing to do with being christened. I'm not going to go into the points about that today. Repentance is what people must do in response to God's call to be saved. We have to turn and have that desire to go God's way and to be born again. As I said before, it cannot be obtained by any form of payment or work. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, put it quite clearly. It is by grace, through faith, we are saved, and not of works, so that no one can boast. It is all a work of God and a free gift. The reason we need this personal saviour is because it was an individual who offended against God. And the buck stopped precisely with Adam. We have inherited a fallen nature, as it is called, because he fell. It wasn't just about being turned out of the Garden of Eden. There was a whole sequence of things which occurred. A simple one was he was given the job of tending the garden. But afterwards, he had to work by the sweat of his brow. That's just one example. But far more serious was that, as we read scripture, that death wasn't what was intended for man any more than hell was intended for man. Hell was intended for the devil and his angels. But this is the enormity of the problem with sin. And similarly, repentance isn't something casual. It is something tremendous. And we must grasp that. The fact is that although condemnation came through Adam, salvation came through Jesus, having been described as the first man and the last man, and all that was entailed in that. But we must never lose sight of the fact that the enemy of our souls, the one who tempted Jesus in the desert, will do absolutely anything he can to completely stop our salvation. But one thing I have noticed throughout Scripture is that although we may sin, there are certain things that Satan cannot do. Number one, Satan cannot make us sin. We sin because we turn our eyes away from God. But another thing he will do is to try 
and distract us with other things. In order to try and stop people being saved, he will occupy their minds with other things. It may be sport. It may be work. It may be a false ideologies and theories such as evolution. And I'm sure we're all familiar with even meeting Christians who accept a theory of evolution ideas and just see how it dampens their witness. Because deep down, they must know they're making a compromise. And God's word will not be compromised. But the things that Satan tries the temptations he makes, none of them will ever succeed in satisfying us. And the promises that Satan makes, none of them will get us a place in heaven. That is solely through Jesus Christ. And the only one who could achieve what God the Father wanted was God himself which is why he sent Jesus, God the Son, to call people to what? He called them to repent and to be born again. And we can see how that works if we look at that verse 4 in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 17, and just see it in context with John's Gospel, chapter 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. There has to be a turning. There has to be a new birth as well. If we heed the message that the scripture tells us, and we share that message alone, not just inviting people to come to church, then people will receive God's challenge just as he intended. But we can't do any more because we cannot save anybody. That is the Holy Spirit's work. So the big question is, what is our desire? What is our desire? Well, there are three references that we'll just be mentioning. It would be folly for anyone to think that having been born again, that they had arrived. In actual fact, the journey has only just begun. And it will last the rest of our life until we actually come into the immediate presence of God. We started on a journey. And there's no suggestion anywhere in scripture that we should expect to have an easy time. Being a believer is not easy. or some people would call us born-again Christians, although in reality, what other kind of Christian is there? There isn't. But if we are born again, we can expect the onslaught of the enemy, because he will do everything in his power to disrupt what God is doing. But we have this confidence, and that is words from Jesus himself, in John chapter 16 and verse 33. And he said, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we know that whatever may come against us, we have, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus' promise. 
we have the victory in him. Jesus just told them the plain truth. Paul said in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verses 8 to 11, and it's the heart cry, really. He says he counts all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He counts things as, a, as rubbish, the things of the world. But he wants to be found in him, in Christ. Not having his own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. We should, I believe also, like Paul, have an increasing desire for the things of God and a lessening of the things of the world in our lives. To be in the world, but not of it. And to know him more and more. And to take up our cross, which is a third of these references. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse Verses 24 and 25. If anyone desires to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Taking up our cross is not an option. It's for each one of us to seek to live in holiness before him, to be pleasing to him, to seek always to honour him and to take our stand for him, come what may. Our salvation cost Jesus his life. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Our salvation, therefore, should be very precious to us. That we are willing to follow the path of a true disciple. May we always be aware that our calling includes this, denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Jesus. And there's no reference whatsoever in Scripture for putting our cross down at any time. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 to 21, it says, we are a new creation. God has reconciled us to himself and he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be come the righteousness of God in him. And in 2 Corinthians 1.22, it tells us that God has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So, God's work as salvation is all his work. It is a free gift and he will never take it away, as we read in the principle laid down in Romans 11.29. He has given us the guarantee, the Holy Spirit. God was serious 
about salvation and we must be serious about it as well. Amen.